All right. Another Scientology podcast coming to you from Music City, actually. Anyway, we're going to pick up with part three of Remote Viewing the Scientology Connection. We have a special guest. Robin Adair will be joining us in a minute. Hi, I'm Dave LaCroix, and we're going to get at it here. Scientology Connection, what does that have to do with remote viewing? Well, I hope you've watched the first two segments preceding this, because in the first one, we went through a lot of the background and the major players and the history and why and the government and answered a bunch of questions about remote viewing. So you really need to watch that episode. And then also in episode two, myself and Robin went through a lot of the players who were surprisingly, no, or not surprisingly, but the fact is they were Scientologists that started the whole government-sponsored remote viewing experiments. And so to get yourself up to date, you need to uh, watch those two before you attempt to track with what this show is about. But um, I'm going to bring up a slide. There's a few things that I want to introduce you with here. So today we're going to take off from there the Scientologists that were involved in the remote viewing experiments. We established that even though people lied about it, tried to cover it up, we established that this whole uh, subject is riddled with liars. <laughs> and we're going to introduce a few more today uh, and why they would lie and why they would want to cover up any connection to Scientology and all this. And from there, we're going to go on to the uh, deep state, you could call it as a term these days, but the deep state's interest in, let's say, squashing or getting control of this whole track of development of research and the technologies that came out of L. Ron Hubbard's organization and out of his research. And so why would they want to, why would they lie about it? Why would they want to get control of it? Why would they want to squash it? And who are the players? So that's what we're going to take a look at. Now, we talked about in the previous ones, we've got the science. I'm not even going to go into the somewhat silly CIA and government definitions of remote viewing. They're, uh, you know, they see it as a sort of a mechanical humanoid activity that has some unexplained extra, extrasensory uh, capabilities that can be developed and, and discovered in people. But of course, as Scientologists, these go back to L. Ron Hubbard's early axioms on what a static is, what a being is, and also what uh, exteriorization is. And so from the viewpoint of a Scientologist, these things are a lot more understandable what remote viewing is. Uh, it's a bit of a misnomer, really, remote viewing, if you understand what exteriorization is. I've got the definitions up here on a slide, but... Um, you're probably familiar with it if you've been around Scientology at all. You've experienced it if you've had some auditing or done some training. And, of course, the government would want to figure out a way to get control of that development and use it for their own shady, less than admirable purposes. Now, we come up to a definition also in present where if you go to Wikipedia, which unfortunately or fortunately, you know, millions, many millions of people use as a resource of information, Wikipedia, as we established in the last one, uh, says there's no scientific evidence that remote viewing exists. So that's the first liar we want to introduce today. <laughs> that's uh, obviously the scientific evidence is just all over the place, especially in the early uh, experiments done by Scientologists. I'm just going to keep repeating that. Now, I'm going to bring up a uh, short audio to see. LRH has a lot of comment that's re commentary that's relatable to this whole topic and what we're going to get into today. So let me just play that first to just sort of, sort of warm us up. 
I try to look far enough in the future to forecast, predict what might be so as not do too many things wrong. You must allow me some percentage. <laughs> And as I look into the future, I see that we are handling here material of a potential control and command over mankind which must not be permitted at any time to become the monopoly or the tool of the few to the danger and disaster of the many. Here, here. Yeah. So that's um, L. Ron Hubbard sort of giving, a, and that was 1955, and we've got it. It's called, it's from the tape, Anatomy of the Spirit of Man. What is Scientology doing? And anybody is free to uh, find that at the website, Scientolopedia.org. It's live streaming there. You can listen to it yourself. 1955, Anatomy of the Spirit of Man. What is Scientology doing? It's that lecture. Now, before I have introduced Robin again, I want to just pose a few questions about remote viewing. We've answered some of these. We've attempted to answer what it was and, um, you know, what is it today um, in our previous couple of episodes. And we answered where the, were the RV experiments a CIA operation. We've definitely answered that. But... We don't know, you may have your own opinion, but did the uh, remote viewing experiments prove that Scientology works? Now that's kind of a funny question, but if you think about it, the CIA sponsored the Scientologists to test OT abilities and they proved that they worked. Now these OTs, and admittedly like Ingo Swan admits that it came as a result of his auditing in Scientology. So in fact, I think we have the answer to that one. Did the RV experiments prove that Scientology works? But did these prompt the government to take action against Scientology? Did that scare them? Did that get them, you know, interested in getting control of this thing? Were some Scientologists actually agent provocateurs for the government all along? That's an interesting concept. Did L. Ron Hubbard know about the, and sanction OTs getting involved? Well, I gave some testimony in the last section that would indicate that it certainly was given to his organization, the Guardian's office. They were kept briefed constantly. Was the government trying to weaponize psychic powers? Well, I've got some stuff that is going to come up here today that uh, we can prove that they were. And did the deep state take over Scientology? Now, that is the $64,000 question. I think the price has gone up on those questions by now, but <laughs> that's from the old TV show. Um, and then lastly, the last one I have here is, are the RV stages routes to total freedom? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. We can kick it around with Robin. But a lot of people look at these sort of magic tricks or these amazing things that they laid out and prescribed in, in stages, almost like a bridge, except we're going to distinguish that they're not a bridge at all. They're just tricks. So anyway, we're going to go into some of these questions a little further today. And now, without further ado, I want to introduce Robin Adair. Robin is an OT7. He's a class auditor, class six auditor, veteran, many, many years, and has taken a deep interest in this subject of the, the deep state and the remote viewing experiments and is very knowledgeable. So welcome, Robin. Good to talk to you. Well, thank you very much, Dave. Yeah, it's good to have you back. I guess just to uh, anything that I brought up so far or all in that sort of introduction that struck you as you wanted to comment on? Nothing to add. Sounds good to me. <laughs> okay. I guess I could. I could be very oh. agreeable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I brought up a slide of uh, Hal Pudoff, uh, just to refresh people's memory. There's Ingo. I got a slide of Ingo and uh, Pat Price. We went through all these guys in the previous show, and that's where we want to kind of kick off from today. 
is other guys of note. Like I have a picture of Yuri Geller here, who's kind of known as a spoon bender. And mm. where the program, what, what we want to get into, first of all, is from the mid 70s, mid to late 70s, when um, Price and Putoff and Swan, the, the original Scientologist who started the program, and then it moved over to the military. Uh, I'd like if you could just talk about that, how it evolved out of Stanford Research Institute into the military and how it sort of went from, from there. Well, actually, one of the best uh, descriptions of that would be on the uh, Federation of American Scientists website, which is interesting because Ron, way back in the late 40s and early 50s, had a connection or association with this group. But anyways, they have an article on their intelligences, intelligence resource program, uh, and it talks about Stargate, controlled remote viewing. And it says Stargate was one of the on number of remote viewing programs conducted under a variety of code names, including Sunstreak, Grillframe, and Centerlane by DIA and INSCOM. That's uh, Intelligence Security Command. Uh, it was uh, under the U.S. Army. And Scanate by CIA. These efforts were initiated to assess foreign programs in the field contract for basic research into the phenomenon and to evaluate remote controlled remote viewing as an intelligence tool. The program consisted of two separate activities. An operational unit employed remote viewers to train and perform remote viewing intelligence gathering, the research program was maintained separately from the operational unit. This effort was initiated in response to CIA concerns about reported Soviet investigations of psychic phenomena. Yeah, it's not necessarily true, but that was sort of one of the excuses they gave. Between 1969 and 1971, U.S. intelligence sources concluded that the Soviet Union was engaged in psychotronic research, that was their name for uh, psychic research. <clears throat> By 1970, it was suggested that it were spending approximately 60 million rubles per year on it and over 300 million by 1975. The money and personnel devoted to Soviet psychotronics suggested that they had achieved breakthroughs even though the matter was considered speculative, controversial, and, quote, fringy, unquote. The initial program, research program called ScanAid, Scan by Coordinates, was funded by CIA beginning in 1970. Remote viewing research began in 1972 at Stanford Research Institute in Menlo Park, California. This work was conducted by Russell Targ and Harold Putkov. Once with the NSA and at the time a Scientologist. So right there, there it is, folks. The effort initially focused on a few gifted individuals, such as New York artist Ingo Swan, a OT level seven Scientologist. Many of the SRI quote impasse unquote were from the Church of Scientology. Individuals who appeared to show potential were trained and taught to use talents for psychic warfare. The minimum accuracy needed by the clients was said to be 65%, and proponents claim that in the later stages of the training effort, this accuracy level was often consistently exceeded, in quotation marks. So there you go. There's the Scientology connection right there. And that's from the uh, Federation of American Scientists website. Was that like, that's up there right in, now? Yeah. It's interesting they refer to it as psychic warfare. <laughs> it's like, you know, I, I just like to emphasize that point of you have these two different 
uh, perspectives on what this technology or any technologies along these lines could be used for. One, L. Ron Hubbard, looking to use it to free mankind and the CIA government getting control of it to wage war or control populations, as we're going to see. So, exactly. yeah, in fact, it's, inter it's interesting, that group, because Perry Chapdelaine, who I did a, a biography of and uh, I've got a videos on the YouTube channel, uh, mentioned that that was one of L. Ron Hubbard's plans back in the 50s to utilize that type of group for expansion, you know, to get credibility, to get uh, recognized more, more broadly noticed and accepted. So, no, yeah, there was a there was a program to introduce Scientology to the government by result, basically, which they actually did with the remote viewing program to a greater or lesser degree. Mm -hmm. Now, I have a slide up from the uh, remote viewing timeline. And the link to this is on the, this is just one snippet of that. The whole rote remote viewing timeline is available. It'll be one of the links at the end of this video and uh, that we've got, you know, attached to the video when it's up on YouTube. So people can look at this themselves. We're not going to try to go through, you know, every individual and uh, the whole evolution. I just wanted to sort of characterize it, that it moved from sort of a research uh, academic uh, endeavor, experimental, uh, funded by the CIA, moving it, then moved to the military. <laughs> the military wanted to see what they how they could use it. And we have different characters involved at the time. I got a picture of uh, McMonagle and uh, who else do I have here? Oh, this guy, you probably know a little bit about him, Courtney Brown, who's... Mm -hmm. Very active. He's very much out there. You'll be on the radio shows and whatnot. You don't have to go far to find stuff where he's talking about it. A lot of people have written books and made money and so forth off of this whole topic. But is there anything else like when the military got a hold of this? Um, any outstanding or things that stand out in your mind that are noteworthy? Um. Well, much of uh, the applications that the military used remote viewing for are still somewhat classified. Uh, supposedly, they were involved in trying to find those who were uh, kidnapped during the uh, crisis in Iran in the late 70s under Jimmy Carter. And I think Jimmy <clears throat> Carter acknowledges the fact that remote viewing was used to find a down Russian aircraft. But other than that, uh, much of the actual operational use of remote viewing is still, to this day, has been classified and wasn't included in the release of the Stargate files, which was the, in 1996. So right. we don't know how many times it was used operationally. But yeah. uh, if you have have a visual map here, you, you find that the government still continues to use psychic abilities uh, to this day under what is considered the Farsight Project, which is run out of the Pentagon these days. So, in fact, I knew a psychic by the name of Sean David Morton who was invo involved in that pro program. There, there are other Miscellaneous programs run out of institutions and universities as well that use psychic ability. Yeah, I mean, there are numerous projects. Yeah, very curious. It just struck me very curious that Wikipedia would say it's never been proven to work. <laughs> and yet the government oh, yeah. uh, went from the military to the government to, you know, the millions and you know, people have uh, sold these training packages and, and uh, it's all just, I mean, it's very reminiscent of what they say about Scientology. No, well, it doesn't work. <laughs> Yet, you know, here we are 60 <laughs> years later and people still yakking about it and uh, whatnot. But, all right, well, the military got interested in it and there's, a, I brought up a screen of the, there was a book written uh by a guy named John Ronson called The Men Who Stare at Goats, who later was, it was later turned into a movie, which is 
bit farcical, but based on some of the stuff that went on with the military and different people that were involved in it at that time. You know anything else about this guy, Ronson, or that book or that movie? Yeah, uh, Ronson, you know, never took the subject seriously. You know, from the from the beginning, his viewpoint, that was ludicrous. So he was just taking a satirical perspective on it, and you can see that by the movie based on the book. Th this is an interesting fact that, believe it or not, I mean, this is hard to believe, the remote viewing project under CIA was mainly controlled by people who were involved in the Church of Scientology or Scientologists, and then when it moved to the military, they started mixing applications in that. Uh, I think uh, a number of remote viewers that worked on the project actually commented on the fact that they included other practices like est and, um, oh, God. I saw a thing where Tony Robbins uh, was involved around this time. He had been pulled into it. Oh, yeah. I mean, there was all, all you know, motivational research, yeah. things like that. Well, they went down uh, other various paths, shiny. They saw shiny things <laughs> and went down chasing them. But uh, I saw I, I wanted to bring up the movie or this men, men who stare at goats. The movie was kind of funny. Uh, if you know the subject and you know from an OT's perspective, it's farcical and attempts to make a bit of a farce of it. But in between there, there's a couple little things that you know might get somebody's interest. So from that point, like in, I, I've got another slide from the timeline thing where in 1989, SciTech was created. And the reason I've got that noted is because this guy, Ed Dames, was one of the founders of that. A bunch of other guys that, you know, names that came up, come up through the remote viewing stuff like um, John Alexander, the Stubblebine guy, Morehouse. Uh, mm. They were involved with SciTech. They started marketing it to the mass public. And besides being interesting, I have a theory. My theory is that this was their way, besides making money and funding the thing, uh, was to recruit, to f come up with, you know, find the people out in the society that had the most natural abilities that could be utilized and then therefore and thereby convert it to the government's purposes. So that's my theory. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. Well, let me add anecdotal evidence to that. Um, mm -hmm. At that, during the, the uh, late '80s, I was working at the Advanced Organization of Los Angeles as an auditor, and a lot of the people that were coming online at that time were people who were involved in the intelligence community in one way or another. Uh, at that time. The grade chart had changed. The original OT levels were taken off the grade chart, but they, it was sort of like the in and out secret menu. If you uh, you could go to an in and out burger and get a secret menu that they was on their website, but wasn't wasn't available on their menu. And many of these people re received the original OT levels, even though they weren't directly available to the public. And then, which is interesting, because this went on during the late 80s until around 89, when SciTech opened its doors in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and all of a sudden, the whole situation changed at the organization, where they actually got rid of most of the staff who were actually non Sea members in the organization, and uh, stopped delivering the advanced those original advanced OT levels entirely. So, yeah, I, I was actually was there at that time. Doing, I did my OT levels there at that time period, and I can tell you that's absolutely true, that uh, for a while they were delivering OT3 expanded, and then, you know, OT7 EP, was called OT7 EP. So you skipped the other original OT levels, 5, 6, and 7, or 5 and 6, four, five, and six. They replaced four with uh, a drug rundown, and they gave you this abbreviated version or partial version of old or original OT7. 
But anyway, uh, I think we'll right. dig into that that change in the church. That's just one, like we could say, exhibit, Your Honor, in the changes that mm -hmm. occurred in the church, coincidentally or time, you know, uh, time alignment to this development of remote viewing or as an outgrowth from remote viewing experiments and the government getting involved, who knows, possibly, dare I suggest, in the Church of Scientology as well. Um, but before we go off on that too much, there's one other guy at this period, this guy that started SciTech, his name is uh, Ed Dames, became well known. Oh, yeah. Got a picture up of Art Bell and Ed Dames side by side here. You know, he, he made a lot of appearances on the Art Bell show, which is a late night show, in case anybody doesn't know, um, dealing with everything paranormal, extraordinary, whatever, from, you know, alien abductions to uh, whatever. So Ed Dames was mm -hmm. a frequent guest and, you know, touted himself as being uh, the remote viewing expert. But he got busted because there was one show, and I did my best to figure out when exactly. I know it was like an, in the late 90s, uh, in August 29th or 30th, and I couldn't nail it down. But the documentation, I've got the link to the website that gives this breakdown. But in one of the shows, Art Bell got a fax from a listener and said, that and I'll just read it. He said, Art, Ed Dames knows, knows damn well that Hal Pudolf, Ingle Swan, and Pat Price, all key players in the remote viewing program, were Scientologists, and that the military intelligence community were dogging L. Ron Hubbard for decades. Remote viewing came from Hubbard's discoveries, and Dames knows it, underlined. Why did he lie or play dumb when you mentioned Hubbard? For instance, the term anchor points is only a Hubbard discovery, only, underlined. So then Art Bell asked Ed Dames, you know, about that. And he said, bunk, it's all bunk. So he denied having any knowledge of that uh, previous, you know, connection to Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard's technology. So this website goes further and debunks, Ed Dames debunking. Because not only have we already, we've already established, I mean, it's not a, even a questionable whether those guys were Scientologists and that connection. But Ed Dames in his talk would use a term like anchor point. So this website goes on to say there's, L. Ron Hubbard had over 706 references to the term anchor points earlier, you know, and uh, in, as, in the early 50s, as early as 1952 way predating the CIA's remote viewing program. And another term that uh, Dames would use would be dimension points, which is another Scientological term. You don't find it anywhere else in literature. And over 100 references to that in L. Ron Hubbard's works on dimension points. It's just a couple of examples. And then one last one, which we'll get into a little bit at the end of the show, is he uses the term to someone that he's coaching in remote viewing he says wait until i put you in the center of the sun well that idea again harkens back to l ron hubbard in processing of one that's called the grand tour by the way did i forget to mention in the beginning that we were going to do some processing we're going to give people a taste of exteriorization at the end of the show i think i did i think i forgot to mention that but oh, well. i mentioned it I mentioned it now. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway, Ed Dames, I'm just documenting that he's a world-class liar. He's a spook. He's an intelligence guy. And again, why do they lie about it? What could possibly be the harm? Well, that's sort of a rhetorical question because spooks are professional. Basically, one of their jobs is to be a professional liar. You know, use cover, lie to people, things like that, mislead them. I mean, that's all part of what they call tradecraft. So, you know, no surprise that Ed Dames would lie, basically. Uh, and when this uh, listener brought up the, the fact that a lot of the terms that he uses were first used by L. Ron Hubbard, since he no longer has any plausible deniability, he just denies. <laughs> yeah. You know, 
and who's going to call them on right. it except for well, we, guys like us that are Scientologists that know, but you know, to the millions of listeners, he just got away with it. Well, of course, that's how they get away with all this kind of stuff. Yeah. They lie, misdirect. I mean, the original remote viewers, that's exactly what they did. I mean, you read Ingo Swan's, uh, like I said, remote viewing, uh, quote, real story, unquote, and all he does is misdirect. He, he barely acknowledges the fact that he was a Scientologist, and he says that he left Scientology early in the 70s. But the fact is that he'd been around Scientology right through to the early 80s when you can see him in a source magazine on the completion list for uh, audited uh, new era Dianetics for OTs. So, you know, he's being somewhat coy about the whole thing. Yeah. You know, for, well, for some reason. I mean, we don't know what his reasons or his motives were for doing that. You know, we can only speculate on that, but we do have evidence that he's just lying his ass off, basically, because he contradicts what he says in those two interviews in that he gave to uh, Advance Magazine, you know, that he said that Scientology was directly responsible for his remote viewing capabilities, basically, or his psychic abilities. So, you know, now he's totally contradicting what he says. So I'm mean, well, you have you the can't, evidence right there. You? you can't you can't see it, but I uh, I had brought up the document, the uh, Scientological Techniques, a modern paradigm for the exploration of consciousness and psychic integration. Uh, it's a little hard to read. It's a little small. This will be linked. Yeah, this is linked at the end of the show, and it'll be on the um, the video. But I just brought that up because um again you know we we established that pretty thoroughly in the last show that swan was a liar Pudoff was a liar they're all liars <laughs> Hard to, what's the old thing you know, about finding a, a, a an honest man the old thing about that you know oh yeah anyway this subject is riddled with liars and ed dames is right in there with them Ed Dames is a primo liar. I mean, you know, like that show on Ed Bell just proves the fact, you know, total denial, you know. Even though he, he brings up the the evidence himself, he totally denies that it has anything to do with Scientology, even though he uses Scientology terminology. I mean, you know, <laughs> what can you say? Yeah. No. It's annoying, but we've been living with that type of annoyance for some time. So, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The next thing I'm going to bring up, and this kind of flows right into this, is they, uh, and I want to sort of wrap up this part of the, you know, the remote viewing chronicles. Um, I've got a slight or a, a slide showing uh, stage 10 and 11 of the remote viewing procedures as it evolved. From my understanding, this mostly came from Ingo Swan, and there's a lot of speculation on these later steps, it goes from one to 11, but they're basically describing OT capabilities. Like stage 10 would be mind over matter, also known as psychokinesis. We have very little understanding of PK, psychokinesis, but we do know it exists. If stage nine is telepathic signals, which affect people, it is logical the next stage would be remote action, signals which affect things stage 10 would be divided into three phases i'm not going to go through all that it's way well, uh, you know i've got a link to this again will be a link that's available but they move into describing you know teleporting things and objects and moving things you know telekinesis and that's where they feel like their whole effort gets to but as i'm going to bring up in a minute the point of it's a bridge to nowhere it goes nowhere because it doesn't remove any charge off the case which to trained auditors and trained scientologists will understand what i'm talking about to somebody that doesn't know uh you, there's a datum in scientology where uh, reality is proportional to charge off the case so you can't 
you can get people to do certain drills and you'll find people that have maybe more psychic abilities than one another. That's just a fact of, you know, beings in this world. But to take the broad public, anyone, and walk them through a progression of steps, eliminating the negativity that surrounds them and connected to them and that they've got stuck to them, there's only one way to do it. And that's the way L. Ron Hubbard developed. So these guys can come up with their stages and their, you know, gobbledygook and tell all the lies they want. <laughs> it gets them nowhere ultimately. Anybody, you know, following that or believing that they're going to get somewhere spiritually is just sadly mistaken, in my opinion. <laughs> well, let's look at the fact that in the early 50s, there were, you know, when Scientology first started, there were all types of processes which one will be running later in the program but there are various types of techniques and procedures used to exteriorize the individual but the thing was is that he never was able to achieve a stable exteriorization even though uh, these techniques were used and they were quite effective but the thing was is that you know the person like he said in exteriorization and high TA the person would leave the body and then come back in eventually, you know. And in some yeah. cases, he'd be tough to audit. So it's like they miss the whole lower part of the gray chart, which is required before one can do the actual OT levels. Yeah. Yeah. Somehow the idea is out there that he just was, you know, making up this stuff. He was a crazy science fiction writer that, you know, was just coming up with stuff out of nowhere. Yet we know that these are very precise and definite steps that need to be taken if you're going to achieve these so-called stages of remote viewing. Anyway, right. uh, my point is that it's not a route. We have routes to greater freedom, greater spiritual awareness, greater mental capability, and remote viewing is not one of them. <laughs> so there's... Uh, you can mess around with it, and it's interesting. It's fascinating, and play around with it all you want. But it's uh, not, you know, doesn't end ultimately result in increased abilities. Well, that's exactly true. Uh, number one, because they avoid any discussion of the Satan or spirit. That, you know that that a person is a spiritual being. So on that basis alone, number two. Uh, by that obfuscation, you can't achieve any spiritual freedom because they don't even acknowledge the fact that it's a spirit. They think of it as a phenomenon of the mind of some kind. And in fact, they go even lower than that. They think it has to do with the brain in some way, brain waves, right. brave brain patterns and things like that, you know. So yeah. they, they've totally unmested the subject, you could say. The, you know, it's laughable when you, uh, for us, you know, when we hear these guys talking about, and we're looking at the brain apparently has the capability to, you know, it's like they're so learned, so intelligent, so articulate, and they've got, they're just so far off the mark at the same time that it's just, it's ludicrous. But anyway, everybody, you know, it's uh, buyer beware. I just wanted to, people tune into this and they're going to go, well, wow, that's fascinating. I'm going to go look it into it and and then get all hooked up in buying the uh, remote viewing DVDs or something. I would spend my time getting with somebody and sitting down and learning how to do uh, TR zero to four. <laughs> It'd be far exactly. more effective time spent. Yeah, very <laughs> true. I was going to say, I mean, you got to take a look at some of the consultants, people, contractors involved in remote viewing. The people you'd expect would be the last to be interested in any type of spiritual freedom at all, like Jolly West, you know, and uh, Margaret Sanger and all those people involved in the original MK Ultra program, you know, which yeah. who were involved in mind control. So any any idea that doing remote viewing procedures would lead to any type of spiritual freedom at all is sort of nixed by this, you know, many of the players involved. Well, with that, 
I'm going to take our stepping off point for uh, next topic or next zone we want to go into are just what you just mentioned. Let me bring in Mr. L. Ron Hubbard again, if I might, and see what he has to say regarding these matters. Sounds good. And I believe that the freedom of the material which we know and understand is guaranteed only by a lightness of organization, a maximum of people, good training, and good, reliable, sound relay of information. And if we can do these things, we will win. But if we can't do these things, sooner or later the information which we hold will become the property of an untrustworthy few. This I'm sure, because it has always happened this way. But that's no reason it has to keep on happening this way. I am not of an inevitable frame of mind. There you go. Exactly. Again, 1955. <laughs> sort, of, sort of saw the handwriting on the wall. Anyway, let's use that as a jumping off point to talk about some of these guys. You mentioned a couple of them. Uh, we'll get to Jolly West in a second. I've got a slide up of this. You had mentioned the other day this guy, Adnan Khashoggi. We're talking about the, this is now, we're, we're moving into this segment, talking about the deep state. We've established right. that Scientologists created this program, drew the attention of the deep state or intelligence community. What do we do now from their perspective? Well, we better get control of it. We better make sure that everything that goes on there, we know what's happening and possibly let's get control of the organization. That might have been their thought process. So let's look at a few guys and a few aspects of this, like this Adnan Khashoggi. Who the hell was he? Well, Adnan Khashoggi was basically a, a, an Iranian arms dealer who uh, was closely associated to Miles Copeland, who was a political operative in the CIA, worked on in the Office of Policy Coordination, and you can read his book, The Game Player, which, by the way, is out of print and hard to find, but still, uh, he was good friends with this guy. And uh, Copeland talks, he, he mentions... Uh, Khashoggi, but he also mentions uh, the CIA's a attempts to use Scientology for their own purposes back in the early 50s, for God's sake. So, I mean, these guys were, uh, you know, trying to figure out what Scientology was and what this guy Hubbard was up to and all this kind of stuff way back in the, near the beginning of the subject. And even if, if you take a look back to uh, Don Purcell, uh, they actually even, that might have been an effort to actually hijack the subject at some point and take it over, you know, because Purcell uh, was able by uh, declaring bankruptcy of the uh, second Hubbard Dianetic Research Foundation was actually able to get control of Ron's copyrights for the subject of Dianetics at that time and had yeah. total control over the subject. So... You know, there's been various efforts in 1963 where they, uh, you know, raided the Church of Scientology, the founding Church of Scientology in Washington, D.C., and took all the books and e-meters. The government effort, he talks about it in politics, freedom from, that the government has been trying to seize Scientology for quite a number of years, and he mentions it in several lectures as well. You know, they constantly made this effort to try and get a hold of the subject because they wanted to control it. And if you take a look at what's currently going on in the Church of Scientology these days, mainly the subject is being controlled by a few elitists within the church itself, you know, members who pay millions of dollars to the, you know, the slush. IAS. Slush. The slush yeah. fund. All right, International Association of Scientologists. And they form this elite group within the church, you know, who 
I mean, and unless you become a member of the IAS, you have no access to the OT levels. It's a very elitist group within the church these days that can only do what the advanced courses. Mm-hmm. So I, they've created their own elite group within the organization itself. You know, this has been going on for quite a number of years. Well, we got the raid in 77 where they busted in and took all the documents out of the geo offices in Washington and Los Angeles. And, you know, people were prosecuted. We got that as, and there was other reasons given for that, but still it's a trail of government involvement and, you know, meddling with Scientology. We have some other characters we're going to explore. Like you mentioned, Jolly West. Now he goes back to the, the CIA drug testing uh, LSD era, but on up through, I remember his name being kicked around. Uh, Heber Gents was talking about Jolly West back in the 70s and even in the 80s, I think. So that guy's been mucking around with the Church of Scientology for a long time. Oh, yeah. I mean, he shows up at interesting points, too. He is one of the uh, psychiatrists involved in evaluating Jack Ruby, who happened to, as you know, kill Lee Harvey Oswald before he can go to trial. And then he happened to be involved in uh, the whole Patricia Hearst incident when she was uh, kidnapped by the uh, Simbi's Liberation Army. So, Mm -hmm. you know, he, he ends up popping up at very interesting points. And then he became a consultant on this whole remote viewing project interestingly enough he has this interesting trail he shows up you know one would wonder uh with this group that was composed mainly of scientologists that why he would be involved at all in a program like this i mean there's no evidence that west or sanger took uh psychic abilities seriously they were very uh well and sanger was a Stone cold enemy of any al- alternative forms of therapy, as I understand it. I mean, she yeah, exactly. wanted, she worked to get chiropractic shut down and attacked and raided, along with who knows, you know, behind the scenes and her connections to Scientology. Oh yeah, and, and uh, good old Jolly was working toward a totally uh, surveilled police state, for God's sake, where children would be uh, psychoanalyzed. You know, to make sure that they weren't going to be, you know, uh, violent criminal when they grew up. And uh, it, it was all, it was a, a mangulin wet dream where he'd take, he had this actual program where he'd take youth that they believed might be violent because of their genetic structure right out of uh, eugenics and separate them from the rest of the population. I mean, this this guy was like a real Nazi, basically. Yeah, that team is not, a, that's not the right team to be on, I would say, <laughs> in my personal opinion. No, no, I mean, <laughs> we call these people suppressive, you know. <laughs> yeah, they're psychos, they're psychotics, they're bent on destruction. Just sticking with this theme of the deep state connections and whatnot to Scientology, we have this guy... I got a slide up of Mead Emery. He comes oh, yes, to play in a number, number of places. Yeah, he was involved in establishing the Church of Spiritual Technology. And most Scientologists within the Church have never even heard of the Church of Spiritual Technology. It's, it's like they, they're told continually that the uh, RTC, or Re- Religious Technology corporation is uh, responsible for Scientology copyrights and trademarks and service marks. But the fact is, is that back in the early 80s, the copyrights were given to the Church of Spiritual Technology and uh, RTC was given control over the trademarks of the subject and registered marks of the subject. And it's actually this Church of Spiritual Technology has the option to assume control over the copyrights if they fell into hostile hands, right? Right. So the more senior organization of the church is the Church of Spiritual Technology. Right. And this guy was on the board of direct and was an an IRS employee, correct? Yeah, he'd he'd been involved in various 
task forces that were may have been linked to bringing down the GO. I mean, they probably considered the GO uh, an existential threat to their taking over of the church because the GO were very uh, independent. They uh, were hard to control. So you can see them wanting to get rid of the GO and Mary Sue Hubbard for that reason and work with a more a minimal group of people like David Miscavige and others like that. Yeah. I was just going to say, this is another link of the deep state uh, intelligence community because they use surrogates. You know, they don't always have to be, you know, have a, a CIA employee card. They can be employed elsewhere or have different titles and whatnot, but nevertheless being on the same team. So this guy, uh, he's documented and we know that there's a deep state link. Yeah, just like so. Khashoggi, who's, whose wife happens to be uh, a Scientologist staying at the flag land base at one time. Well, let's talk about Michael Rinder. He actually gave Khashoggi a tour of the uh, Fort Harrison and thought he was a really nice guy. And anyone who knows the history of Khashoggi knows that he's one of the architects of various black operations conducted by the CIA and other members of the intelligence community that are alive through various money laundering activities and things like that. Well, interesting you should mention Rinder because I got a slide of him up now. I think we find Rinder littering the countryside with connections to the deep state. Like you just mentioned one, we know he was part of the takeover from the GO to turn the intelligence gathering and those functions over to the Sea Org under the direct control of David Miscavige. And in more recent times, he's had and made comments about having, you know, ties and contacts in the FBI and other agencies. Personally, I wouldn't trust him any farther than I could throw him. But what's your comment? What's your take on his role in all this? Well, he's very interesting. He tried, he played coy for quite a while, and then all of a sudden when he left the church, he had all of these connections all of a sudden with, you know, various people in the FBI and probably individuals involved in the deep state. It is very fascinating, you know, since he left the church. And he was one of the people who established the uh, Office of Special Affairs. Mm-hmm. Uh, which uh, took over after the GEO was abolished in 1982. And it's interesting because the gift of attention from GEO, which mainly was interested in what the government was doing, had shifted to going after critics of the Church of Scientology, right? And making, basically, the, the GEO conducted uh, what was called Operation Freakout. But when... Uh, OSA took over, Office of Special Affairs, they expanded Operation Freakout-like activities throughout the, using the internet and various things, and went after critics of the church using similar tactics. Uh, It's all in a wired article called Alt Scientology War, and and Rinder was was one of the people who was directly involved in these activities against critics. Well, and, and let me just interject because while I'm thinking of this, because they went after David Mayo. Now, people have different opinions about Mayo, but he was there. He would have been like a, a bulwark against watering down and altering the technology, in my opinion. I could be wrong about that, but it's just interesting when you brought up they, they went after critics, but they also went after, went after people that could possibly – exposed the fact that the church was now delivering or had watered down technology compared to the original. Like, I think he brought up that the original OT levels were taken off the grade chart back in the late 80s. Um, there's I mean, many no, other actually, signs. You, actually, it was David Mayo who was responsible for taking the original OT levels off the grade chart. Okay. David Mayo... I mean, when you you get into uh, deep state activities, you find all these groups. It's not just this vast overriding conspiracy. There are many different people who have different interests. And, and David Mayo was 
was directly involved in eliminating the OT levels from the original grade chart. There's no doubt about it, for whatever reason. Because in 1982, he rewrote the grade chart and, and called uh, and replaced OT levels above three with new OT4, new OT5, new OT6, new OT7, all that kind of stuff, right? Just before OT8. So, I mean, it's, you get a very complicated picture there. But anyone, I mean, they went after Mayo, but they went after other individuals too and really create a lot of dissension because there are a lot of people who like Mayo, right? And upset. Yeah within the Scientology community, like the famous mission conference that occurred yeah. later in 1982, for instance. That created a lot of ill will as well. In fact, it seemed like OSA was, was spent most of their time creating ill will, whereas the GL mainly uh, concentrated their activities on the government and what the government was doing to Scientology. OSA was going after anyone and anyone who had a, an opinion that they considered averse, you know. Well, I, I think that's uh, a very astute, po an astute observation that the shift being from an outward facing or outward attention and, and nullifying the potential adversaries against the church to going after, they're almost internal, even though they're no longer with the church, but uh, it's former members and uh, people that had a history with the church. Anyway, so okay. it's a... It's an interesting observation on that shift. We've got so many circumstantial things that happen. The government attacking the church and having these people that we've already mentioned and many others. The shift in the delivery of the uh, materials, the OT levels changing, making it more and more difficult for people to do the OT levels. We talked about, uh, you and I personally just talked about eligibility to get onto the OT levels was just made ridiculously difficult and all these things kind of add up to the fact that you know Scientology was pretty much stopped dead in its tracks you know there's not really been any expansions beyond the late 70s early 80s and I don't that's not coincidental and I don't think it has nothing whatsoever to do with the remote viewing experiments and Scientologists demonstrating that Scientology could create these extraordinary capabilities within people so oh yeah perish the thought there's one little interesting thing a point i wanted to make where um render again whatever his allegiance there's games within games you know it would be not unreasonable to play a game of get control of the church and bring it down or stop the halt the progress of delivering these super capabilities to random humans <laughs> and at the same time, send somebody outside to totally trash the reputation of that brand and that organization, the net result is just like a complete irretrievable, irrevocable, uh, irreparable brand and activity to just make it so unpalatable that nobody would want to come near it with a 10-foot pole. Or Marty Rathbun, who I'm no fan of, but he made a comment recently that he was approached by Rinder and Remini in their, produce, their production of the TV show they've got running and was indicated that they had no shortage of funds. They had almost unlimited funds. He could name his price if he were to get involved. So where did that kind of money come from? You know, there's always, you can say, follow the money. But um, that's just an interesting side note. It doesn't, con it wouldn't convict anybody of anything, but certainly interesting to throw into the mix here. Yeah, I, I mean, while we're on that train of thought, I mean, take a look at one of their biggest promoters, which is Tony Ortega, who happens happened to have been the editor in chief of the Village Voice. And when he took over, he uh, introduced what was called Backpage, which was sort of a Craigslist for pedophiliacs, people who wanted small, small children for sexual purposes, and. Uh, He's a big promoter of Backpage for quite a number of years. And he's like one of their biggest fans, you know, Rinder and uh, Re Leah Remini and uh, Aftermath. Yeah, of course, you got Lawrence Wright and Alex Gibney as well, who Alex Gibney went after WikiLeaks 
just a while back with We Steal Secrets that tried to malign uh, Julian Assange because he was releasing, all, he was a whistleblower. And uh, they were trying to make it look like he was some kind of spy or something like that, you know, by uh, releasing information that was adverse to the deep state. And he, uh, Julian, actually responded to give me a hit piece, uh, uh, We Steal Secrets, you know, we're on his page on WikiLeaks. But he's the one who was responsible for... Uh, making a documentary of uh, Lawrence Wright's book. And Lawrence Wright is another deep state actor who was, you know, wrote the book on uh, the Looming Tower and his questionable research on 9-11 is totally avoiding CIA's involvement with uh, radicalizing the uh, Islamic community uh, by funding uh, the... Uh, Jihad in Afghanistan through the Mahajin, right? But mm -hmm. it's interesting that Lawrence omits all this information from his book, and then he later writes a book on going clear in the prison of belief, which Gibney makes into a, quote, documentary, right? Which is just another yeah. hit piece this time against the Church of Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard. Well, I think... Uh what we've done is raise some questions. We don't have all the answers. There's a lot of circumstantial connections, circumstantial evidence that things are not as they seem. And it's up to the individual to look deeper, not buy into the narrative that's put forward. Uh, in these days, you got to be super sharp and know your data series, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't know what I'm talking about, the data series, look it up. <laughs> Google it. I don't know if you, what you're going to find on Google, but uh, find some Scientologists. They can cue you into what the data series is, and you won't be thrown off and follow a lot of weird trails. I'm going to take this to the next thing or sort of wrap up that we've, we've hit on the deep state and uh, the purposes, the difference, the diverging tracks – between L. Ron Hubbard's research, what he was trying to accomplish, like I've said before, about taking man from his current state to higher states of awareness and freedom of, you know, the things that his ills that he considers to be ills himself. And the deep state or the intelligence communities wanting to weaponize any technologies they can get their hands on and end up in a state of control. Now, recently, there was a, I got a slide up that you can't see, Robin, but a book that I came across and a guy that I heard talk, but this is just one little excerpt from his book. His name is Dr. John Hall, and the book is called Guinea Pigs, Technologies of Control. And I thought that's very interesting, Technologies of Control, because as we know, on the whole track, basically the whole effort on the track is to take any random, wild, independent beings and get them under control. <laughs> this has been a, a long-standing mm -hmm. battle that's gone on. And so here on planet Earth today, we have this deep state that has moved along since the early 1970s, or even prior to that, they've been interested in all this, to work in a direction mm -hmm. of a control of the population that is not for our benefit. It's for the my, you know, the very small percentage of elites. Anyway, he says the goal of the experimentation, this is referring to what's going on out in the environment today. The goal of the experimentation has been to figure out how to remotely control a human being and seems to be moving in the direction of controlling the population at large. He gives an example of how victims are often placed in a difficult position when they report these crimes since agencies like the FBI are aware of the technology and know that the CIA and NSA are funding the research and giving access to subcontractors can, to conduct experiments on a wide sample of the populace. And then another example he gives, some of the victims report hearing d direct voices in their head describing accurately what they are doing and what they are wearing, for instance. So... There are people that are awake and alert and have been watching this and seeing what's going on, but maybe it's, is it too few, too late, or 
is there still hope that people can wake up to these things and what's going on and rid ourselves of it once and for all? That remains to be seen. Now, I'm going to make one last statement that, uh, in my opinion, the answer to that is that eventually the bad guys lose and the good guys win. <laughs> but because uh, I think that all this effort by the deep state, by the intelligence agencies, by the governments to control not only psychic research, but the Church of Scientology, L. Ron Hubbard's research, came a little bit too late. The barn door closing after the horses have gotten out. The horses mm -hmm. got out. They're running wild out in the environment, and the technology, the subject is alive and free outside of the church, so they completely failed at harnessing, controlling, shutting it down, and the things that are going on at the upper levels today are just as astounding as they ever were, in fact, more so. I won't say any more than that, but that's what I have found to be true for me. You are totally free to make your own determination <laughs> now i'm putting oh, yeah. some links up i'm putting some links up, uh, up and these all these links will be available uh on the video at the tail end of the video i'll go i have t actually two slides we have a lot of links from the ed dame stuff we talked about that mind map ingo swan stuff hal pudoff's talking about all this so people that are interested in researching hopefully we've scratched an itch or probed a little bit to get people to look at this stuff and come up with their own knowledge, their own opinions. Anything else uh, on all that you want to say, Robin? Well, you know, Ron pretty well talks about that himself uh, in uh, various uh, HCOBs, you know, like the, the it's very hard to put the uh, toothpaste back in the tube and Scientology is already out there. So, they can't really stop it from being applied. All they can do is try to subvert it to a greater or lesser degree and distract people away from it. They can't really destroy the subject because it's still available to anyone who wants to use it. You know. yeah. So they missed their opportunity. Well, they were right there at the beginning. They were. It's not for lack of effort. It's just I think they got outsmarted, outfoxed by a guy named L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> you know, he was always one step ahead of him. Yeah. They, I mean, I, I think it's funny. To me, it's funny. There he was. They closed in on him. They got all the governments of the world to uh, deny him access to the ports. And, you know, they're going to kick him out of England. And so what does he do? He creates a fleet of ships and goes to sea. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's really funny when you think about it, you know, that they tried to box him in. And he just says, well, the hell with you. I'll just create a Navy of my own, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's right. It's a, a very funny story, really. It's quite a story. Yeah. I'm going to bring up one last little audio excerpt to sort of tee up our next thing we're going to do, which is a bit of processing, processing, as they say. Let me just tee this up for you guys and here you go this is uh, having to do with exteriorization and by extension remote viewing well it starts like this it starts like this i was up in the van allen belt this is a uh, factual and uh, i don't know why they're scared of the van allen belt because it's simply hot uh, you'd be surprised how warm space is down amongst the clouds and so forth. It can get pretty cold and damp, but you get well up and uh, sunlight shining around, that sort of thing. It's quite hot. And uh, the Van Allen belt was uh, radioactively hot. A lot of photons get trapped in that area and so forth. And I was up there watching the sunrise. Well, that was very interesting, and uh, my perception was very good, and I was good taking a look at Norway and Essex and the places around, you know, and getting myself sort of oriented. And then something happened to me that I didn't know quite what had happened to me. I, I thought some facsimiles must have appeared in front of me, but they didn't look like facsimiles. And uh, uh, some other things happened, and uh, I had a feeling like I might possibly go into the sun, and... Uh, 
a few other little uncomfortablenesses there where uh, that, that wasn't what awed me. But I got confused. I got confused because the sun was suddenly larger and then it was smaller. And somehow or another, I was doing a change of space process that I myself was not uh, uh, familiar with. And uh, it made me sort of uh, bite off my fate and fingernails just a little bit, you know. <laughs> so that was a little bit of um, from a lecture in... Um, was it 1963, he was talking about, it's the title of that lecture, we'll have a, a link to it, was uh, Re Between Lives Implants. So without further ado, I think we'll go into a little bit of processing with Mr. Robin Adair. He's going to take, take a process and he can explain it. Over to you, Robin. Okay, well, everyone who's listening, this is a process called R19. It's part of Route 1 in the uh, creation of human ability. And uh, it goes like this. So I just want any, anybody out there who's listening to follow the commands. And don't question them. Just try and do them. And uh, here's the first command. Be near the earth. Okay, now, here's the next command. Be near the moon. Okay, now, this is the next one. Be near the sun. Okay, now, be near the earth. Okay, now be near the sun, the moon. All right, right. now be near the sun. Now, earth, moon, sun, earth, moon, sun, earth. Moon, sun, earth, moon, sun. Now find a rock. All right. Now be inside of it. Okay. Now be outside of it. All right. Inside, outside, inside, outside, be in the center of the earth. All right, now be outside of earth. Inside, outside, inside. Outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. Now that you've done that, be near Mars. Very good. Now be at the center of Mars. Outside of Mars. Okay. Center. Outside. Now move down slowly toward the surface. All right, then, be on the surface of Mars. Be above Mars. Be on the surface. Be above Mars. Move down to the surface of Mars.
All right. Now, be at the place where you entered the mass universe. All right, now be at the center of this room. All right, now be at the place where you entered the mass universe. Good now, center of this room. All right, now entrance point. Room, entrance point. Room. Okay. <clears throat> now that we've done the grand tour, we're going to increase your happiness a little bit here. I want you all to put up eight anchor points as though they were corners of the cube around you. Okay, now pull them in on you. Okay, put up eight more in the same manner. Now pull them in on you. Okay, put up eight more. Pull them in on you. Okay, now that, that completes the process. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you enjoyed it. That ends the session. <laughs> well, thank you, Robin. That was... Uh, okay. Very good, very good. All right. Well, Robin, thank you so much for doing this series with me, and I'm sure that we'll get some comments as a result. By the way, anybody that has any comments they'd like to make on the YouTube page when this is published, you can do that or go to the Scientolopedia page where it's published and you can comment there as well. But um, thanks again, Robin. It's a great uh, show. Great having you with me. And I appreciate all your help in getting this information out. Well, you're welcome, Dave. And uh, it was fun. I hope everybody who was listening had a good time. Well, I do too. And, well, uh, uh, maybe maybe we'll cook up something else to uh, dive into. I think that whole thing of the deep state could be explored more, but uh, we'll see. We'll be in touch. I agree. We we could put something right. together on that. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. And I want to thank you for joining us on the Scientology podcast. Stay tuned to our. YouTube channel. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. Go to Scientolopedia.org. We'll have all these podcasts in one place for you. And we'll be back soon to bring up more topics of interest to the Scientology and the community at large, the Scientology community as well. Bye-bye.